Helen, how long have you been in China? It's been just over eight years. Do you know why we are here today? Well, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say it's because my arrival in China coincided with the APEC meeting, which was held here next to Yaqing Lake in the suburbs of Beijing in Huairo, which is also in the shadow of the Great Wall. And it's funny, really, I, I think back to alighting that plane all those years ago, and I had these ideas where I was just expecting pollution and poverty. And instead, in those first few weeks, I explored Beijing under these gorgeous blue skies. And it really dawned on me, it was like a clarity of mind almost, as clear as the skies in fact, that I had a lot to learn and a massive country to learn from. During your time here, what do you think have been China's biggest achievements? Whoa, the first thing that comes to mind relates to scale. So that's the poverty alleviation campaign, which swept across the country and helped some of the nation's most underprivileged communities. But then if you were to frame that same question in terms of impact, then it would have to be the regreening of the desertified areas, which is helping to create a much nicer, cleaner, wonderful environment for the whole country. We know that you've traveled a lot. So did you keep a record of how many places you've visited in China? Well, apart from all the videos I've made, because out of the 23 provinces and regions that I've visited in China, most of them have been with the Xinhua team. And in fact, it's almost become a running joke now because I keep pitching ideas for those last couple of provinces and regions. Which place left the lasting impression on you? I would say straight away, no second thoughts, Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region. Um, actually, it's known sometimes as the Bordeaux of China because of the growth of the winemaking industry locally. But when I went there in 2017 and then again in 2018, I eschewed the vineyards for a much more sobering experience. You see, in the south of the region, if they have 400 millilitres of rain a year, they consider that to be a good year. And so the lives of the communities there are as hard as the soil on which they toil. The UN deemed it unsuitable for human habitation. And so after years, generations even, of people eking an existence off the land, whole communities were relocated to the north as part of this huge relocation project. So from the south and up to the north where the Yellow River nourishes the yellow soil. Helen, tell us about this photo. Okay. Oh, this is a picture of Mrs. Gore, who I met on my first trip to Ningxia. In fact, she said something that would really stick with me. She said that rural schools uh, were giving her children access to opportunities that she could never have dreamed of. And it's been five years since I met her, and I would love to go back and see how her family's getting on. What about the more recent trips? Where did you go last year? Well, I went to Guizhou twice, and I'd say it's one of my most favorite uh, places in the whole of China. And not just because it reminds me of Wales, because it rains a lot. Uh, the first time I went there was back in 2017, which was to profile the ongoing efforts as part of the poverty alleviation campaign. But then when I returned last year, 2021, that project was almost at fruition. And so the focus had changed and it was starting to look at ways to maintain the successes of the past year and to help people going forward. And that meant that there was going to be many initiatives, most uh, significantly for my video at least, tourism. And that saw me experience one of my most favorite pastimes, the hot springs. And I thought, well, you know, this is the sort of work I can get on, on with. Uh, but, you know, that's by the by. What I did experience was how close hot springs were to the local communities and how this, um, this tradition was enabling them to make money from tourism. It's an absolutely brilliant initiative. Helen, is there any experience with the Xinhua team that's been unique? Well, it was a few years ago, but I did get to meet one of China's first taikonauts. Actually, we have prepared a video clip. Take a look. Oh, I remember this. This was at the training base for Taikonauts. Do you still remember how you felt on that rotating chair? <laughs> I do. Dizzy and discombobulated. 
But that wasn't even the highlight of that trip. I got to speak to a real life astronaut. And in fact, not just one, more than one of them. And the most inspirational individual I spoke to was Wang Yaoping, China's second female taikonaut. And off camera, she told me about the nuts and bolts of being a woman in space. But for those sort of insights, you'll have to wait for my memoirs to come out. And aside from my personal queries, Wang and her colleagues told me about how in the last 20 years, and especially the previous decade, China's space program had gone from being in the shadows to the real possibility of China landing on the moon. And today, as I sit here, that dream has become reality when in January 2019, China became the first nation to make a soft landing on the far side of the moon. Any concluding remarks? From tilling the earth to contemplating the stars, China is working to solve problems as old as time and also issues never encountered by the human race. I've got a feeling that China is not done surprising me just yet. <laughs>